everyone, and welcome back to our exploration on how we deliver oxygen around the body. Now, in our last video, we kind of ended things on a bit of a cliffhanger, which was to say, how is it that hemoglobin is able to transport oxygen? So here's the thing. Do we want hemoglobin to have a high binding affinity, meaning that hemoglobin is able to bind and hold on to oxygen very easily? Or do we want it to have a low binding affinity? That is to say, it's very easy for hemoglobin to sort of let go of this oxygen. Well, the answer is we kind of want both because when we are in the lungs over here, when we're looking at the alveoli, we want hemoglobin to have a high binding affinity. We want it to scoop and pick up all of those oxygen molecules as effectively as it can. Whereas when we get down into the tissues, we want hemoglobin to have a low binding affinity. So we want hemoglobin to not want to hold on to those oxygen molecules when we're at the tissues down here, because we want that oxygen to be delivered. So what is the answer? How, do, how can hemoglobin get the best of both worlds? Well, it's simple. Hemoglobin can exist in two different states. It can exist in a T state or R state. Now, a good way to remember this is T for tissues and R for respiratory, because when hemoglobin is in its T state or tensed state, that means it has a low binding affinity and we can find hemoglobin in its T state near the tissues. However, when hemoglobin gets towards the lungs, what's going to happen is it's going to turn into its R state, which is relaxed. And that is when it has a high binding affinity for oxygen. So even though T and R stand for tensed and relaxed, I want you to try and think of it as tissue and respiratory. It's just a good little way to, uh, to remember that in your mind's eye. So what is actually happening here? Well, hemoglobin as a protein has four little binding sites for oxygen. Now, if hemoglobin has no oxygens bound to it, it is very much so in its T state. Whereas if it has all four oxygen molecules bound to it, it's very much in its R state. So how does that work? How is it that hemoglobin has two different states to begin with? Well, these four binding sites are able to move around each other. So they're able to slightly move around and this helps to change the binding affinity of oxygen to hemoglobin. So as a result of this, oxygen is called an allosteric effector. So what this essentially means is oxygen, when it binds to hemoglobin, causes it to change its conformation, causes it to change its shape. And as we've discussed multiple times, structure equals function. So if we're changing the shape of hemoglobin, we're changing how it's going to be functioning. So when oxygen binds to hemoglobin, it causes hemoglobin to move or transition towards its R state and makes it easier for oxygen molecules to bind to hemoglobin. So this process is called cooperative binding. So what do we mean by cooperative binding exactly? Well, what we see with hemoglobin down the very bottom here is that it is very much in its T state. It has no oxygen molecules bound to it and its binding affinity or the willingness for hemoglobin to bind to those oxygen molecules is very low. So how do we force hemoglobin to go back to its R state? Well, it's essentially like you're trying to throw spaghetti at a wall and see what sticks, except what we're doing here is throwing oxygen at the hemoglobin molecule and seeing what oxygen sticks. Because remember, as we are moving towards the lungs, the concentration or the partial pressure of oxygen is going up. What this means is, is that there's a greater chance that an oxygen molecule is going to hit that hemoglobin protein just right and bind to one of those four binding sites. Now, once one of those oxygens binds, it is going to act as an allosteric effector. It's going to cause hemoglobin to begin to change, begin to shift its shape to move towards its R state. Now, is it completely in its R state? No, it's sort of like a sliding scale. It's transitioning towards that R state. But by that single oxygen molecule binding to hemoglobin, it's made it easier for another oxygen molecule to bind to 
one of the other three binding sites. So then a second oxygen molecule binds and once it's bound, it's now going to transition even further towards its R state, which is gonna make it even easier for that third oxygen molecule until eventually all four oxygen molecules are bound to hemoglobin and hemoglobin is firmly in its R state. So this is incredibly effective for hemoglobin to be able to really pick up and scoop up all of those oxygen molecules when we're at the lungs. So how is it that hemoglobin is able to transition from its T state to its R state? Essentially, it comes down to oxygen concentration. So as we move towards the lungs, because there is so much oxygen present there, it means that there is a greater chance for oxygen to bind to those hemoglobin proteins, meaning that they're going to transition from that T state to the R state, meaning that it's even easier for subsequent oxygen molecules to bind until it's completely saturated. Now, of course, it is actually quite rare that we see our hemoglobin proteins dip below, say, 75% because what we're seeing is oxygen being dissolved in our blood. Granted, it's not very soluble, but it moves from the blood into our tissues. So essentially the hemoglobin proteins are able to sort of replenish the oxygen that's in our blood. So it can then effectively move through into our tissues. So in our next video, what I want to explore is, well, what happens when we get to the tissues? Because what we have effectively done is put hemoglobin in its R state. So it has a very high affinity for oxygen, meaning hemoglobin at the moment is holding on to those oxygen molecules, but doesn't want to let go. So in our next video, we're going to explore what happens when hemoglobin gets to the tissues and how we can persuade hemoglobin to let go of those oxygen molecules. So I'll see you in the next one.